your life. Welcome to the pre-dawn. Um, we can see a little bit of light in the sky behind me, and we're out on a live African safari. My name is Brent Smith. I have uh, Brian Joubert back with me, and together the killer bees. Killer bees. So hopefully the killer bees can find you some killer cats. And uh, we haven't heard any lions calling this morning. I know Jamie's on her way to go check the last position of the Inkuma Pride. I'm feeling a bit spotty this morning, so we're going to go look for some leopard. And so it's Jamie and Andrew out on the Mahindra and the other vehicle at the moment. Hopefully a jigger will be up and running by the Sunset Safari. And we have uh, Nicola and Geraldine in final control this morning. So hopefully... Oh, did you hear that, Brian? Uh, it's just some guinea fowl waking up. Thought it might be an alarm call for a second or two there. And if we have a look, it's one of these really stunning mornings. You can actually see how fast the cloud is moving at the moment. This one in particular right here, as it drifts across our frame. It's at 17 degrees Celsius, about 70 Fahrenheit. So a very pleasant temperature and a great temperature to go look for cats. You hear dawn chorus starting. Got a Cape turtle dove telling me to work harder, work harder. So I intend to. Some guinea fowl, white browed scrub robin. And a woodlands kingfisher. And on the note of the woodlands, let's head off. Hopefully, we don't have to walk too hard for our cats this morning. And I know a lot of you will be sending Brian lots of big welcomes back. Welcome back. He's just got back from holiday. He's looking rested and refreshed and ready to hopefully spot the leopards for me so I don't have to do too much work. Uh, we use a spotlight in the morning and just a reminder to everyone that from tomorrow uh, the times will be changing we'll be going out half a late half an hour later for the sunrise safari so we should be driving around in the light not having to use a spotlight so in case any of you pick up a flash of eyes in my spotlight as i maneuver through juma private game reserve if i immediately gloss over those eyes it means it's of a, a, a herbivore and a predominantly diurnal herbivore those of you not sure what diurnal means it means daytime and we don't shine our spotlights on daytime predominantly daytime animals uh, we can blind them not permanently but for a little bit which it makes it a little bit easier for the predators to grab them so we don't want to affect what happens around us so if you see me just either gloss over or turn my light off, don't worry, I'm not trying to hide animals from you. I'm just trying to make sure that the animals have a pleasant morning as well. I thought I saw a bush baby, but it's disappeared. So we're about to go through this little hollow. So if we do have any signal breakup, I do apologize uh, in advance. so quiet and it's because I've accidentally pulled out my my ears. I thought final control ignoring me. Me ignoring them. So very interesting. I, I cannot 100% confirm this report that we got yesterday that Tandy uh, and Karula were arguing and mating with Tingana in the same sighting to the south of us. So on the off chance they might be close to our boundary, that's where we're heading, uh, the Sunrise Safari. 
but wouldn't that be incredible? Two females mating with the same male. And not only two females, but mom and daughter mating with the same male. Well, at least we know they've got the same taste in men. Oh, and we have been having some incredible reptile sightings, so let's jump across to Jamie, who's got another one for you. Everybody, and look at this little guy. Isn't he epic? Tiny, tiny little snake that seems to be determined to head across underneath my wheel, which is not where I want him to be. Fascinating little thing. I think it's a thread snake. I need to double check in my book. One of those tricky ones because it is so, so tiny. But just have a look at the way that it's moving now. That's not where I want you to be, little guy. Not under there. Oh dear. Not that way. Uh-oh. That's not good planning. Fascinating little snake with a bright yellow nose. Beautiful little thing. And it is seeking refuge in the darkness underneath my tire. That's not where I want him to be at all. And hopefully, try and provide you with some light here, but hopefully we'll be able to, as soon as he, we start the engine, he'll move off away from the tire and we'll be able to move on safely. There's another vehicle coming up behind us, so we will have to move, although they should be able to sneak around us. But what a great way to start our bushwalk this morning, our bushwalk slash Mahindra drive the more intimate experience of our behind the scenes whilst Jigger undergoes heart surgery. My name is Jamie, I have Andrew on a camera with me and it's going to be a fantastic morning so I hope you're all excited. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari and while I figure out how to move the snake out from underneath my wheel, I'm going to send you back across to Brent. Reptile that could possibly be Definitely going to have to have a look in the book uh, and I'll have a look at the screenshots as well. Hopefully Jamie can figure it out before the end of the Sunrise Safari. Oh, uh, no, just hyena tracks. straight off to the eastern boundary. Uh, from the eastern boundary we're going to head south and then down towards the area. Uh, oh no, don't worry, just a diker. I just heard a Franklin get a fright and I got a fright from the diker running past. on Safari Live. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to identify it for you before the end of uh, Safari, David. And we have been seeing quite a few snakes recently. And that is due to the very dry spell we're experiencing. So normally at this time of the year, the grass would be very high. So there would be lots of slithering snakes around, but they would be slithering through the undergrowth and we wouldn't be able to see them. But fortunately we can now. And 
with this almost zero grass in the area. It does also make it a lot easier for us to find the lions and the leopards and see their tracks. So although drought can be quite hard on some animals, it definitely makes it a little bit easier for us to find the animals. And as I have mentioned before, drought and is not necessarily a bad thing in the bush. If you are a farmer, of course, it is a terrible thing. But uh, if you're in a natural system like we are, and an unfenced natural system of 3.9 million hectares, so well over 8 million acres of unfenced wilderness that we form a very small part of droughts lead to a strengthening in genetic stock amongst animals like wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, buffalo. So the ones that survive have got the best genes. So in the next wet spell, you're going to have very, very fit animals to take on the next couple of years. Also, animals like lions, especially during the drought, uh, their population in this area has been recorded by increasing up to 15%. So hopefully we should see a few more lions while we go through this dry spell. bush baby me too carolyn me too and we do have a little chance still in this uh, pre-dawn light it's still dark enough some of the bush babies we might be on their way home still so i will be keeping a very sharp eye out uh, to see if we can find a bush baby hopping home jumping home so uh, bush babies have multiple den sites within a territory which are normally hollows in the trees and actually very cute when they sleep. They sleep in little bundles, maybe four or five bush babies at a time. A lot of people think having a bush baby as a pet is a good idea. I guarantee you it's not. And a very little interesting, I suppose, uh, evolutionary trait of bush babies. And there's multiple reasons for why they do this. Um, they urinate on their hands and feet. So it helps a little bit with their grip as they jump through from tree to tree. But the main reason they do this is so they can spread their scent in marking territory further. So everywhere they walk, they leave a little bit of scent uh, to let any other bush baby who might be encroaching on their territory to tell them to beware. You might be leapt upon by the resident bush baby. They live in little family groups. And they have very, sometimes they have very set routes where they get going from in the evening. And if you find those routes, it's almost like clockwork at the same sort of time every day that they will depart from that spot. Unfortunately, the only really set clockwork bush baby movements I know about happen to be in uh, the general manager of Tumas Garden. So I don't think we can take our vehicle in there this morning. We might, we might be. Um, told less than politely to go away. So, uh, good morning to Michael Fleetwood. How's it, Mike? Uh, Mike would like to know when would the, the drought end. Well, Michael, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, basically, we have a few different types of cycles that work out here in the bush. And uh... oh, he's going to go too far, isn't he? Sorry, guys, I just saw a butterfly. Sometimes in the early morning, when there's still a bit of dew, they don't move around as much. Landed on that little spike when you got in there, Brian. Yeah. It is a joker. 
but took off there. I was hoping it was one of my favourites, the Acrea, one of the Acreas, but alas, just a common joker. Sorry, Michael, back to your question. Um, as I said, your guess is as good as mine, but generally, on if we if we take it down to the most base cycles we get here, we normally work on a seven to eight year wet and dry, and we've just come out of a very wet cycle. It doesn't mean the drought will continue for, for eight years, but we're going to have a much drier eight years than we did the previous. So uh, when this drought breaks, I'm not 100% sure, and it's difficult enough to predict the weather for tomorrow, let alone in six months' time. And uh, a lovely little quote by one of my favorite authors, Mr. Hemingway, two things one should never predict, the weather and a woman's moods. Probably going to get in a bit of trouble for that one, but I'll take it on the tin. quiz yesterday and the gremlins were causing quite a bit of havoc so I think it might have slipped my mind so just to remind everyone uh, that what Linda is referring to is I asked a question uh, about meta populations of cheetah what is the largest where sorry not what where is the largest meta population of cheetah in Africa so meta population is the largest population with the most genetic diversity. Uh, so who will throw it out there again, see if anyone's got some ideas. What is the largest meta population of cheetah in Africa and where do they occur? And if you do know the answer or you'd like to have a gander, uh, drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv just simply whack it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. And while we're speaking of Twitter and such things, um, well done to Safari Dean, uh, James Richards and CC Art Design, who accepted the challenge to put up their audio versions of mating leopards. The rest of you out there are chickens. But well done to those three. My hat goes off. You are good sports, scholars, and gentlemen and ladies. The rest of you should hang your heads in shame. Safari, welcome uh, to uh, Chelsea and Tammy. Uh, Chelsea has brought her eight-year-old daughter, Tammy, along uh, to watch. And she said, what time is it there? It's 20 past nine in the evening, uh, wherever you might be. But don't forget uh, to tell us where you're from, and then we can try to figure out time zones. No, I'm joking. So if it's 20 past nine where you are, it is 20 past five a.m. And they're from Iowa. So it's 20 past 9 at night for you guys, and it's 20 past 5 in the morning for us. So, a very warm welcome, and yes, we are live. Hi. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy, and hopefully we can find you some animals this morning. to Brian Jacheson, and he'd like to know whether we are looking forward to an extra 30 minutes of sleep. Well, 
Brian, to be honest, uh, <laughs> we are up so early that I don't think 30 minutes makes difference. And I'm just happy to be out on safari. So, probably not. I'm happy to be out. I'll probably still be up around a certain time. So what happens is your, your body clock gets set. It's probably gonna take me a month or two not to wake up at quarter to four in the morning. Uh, and uh, I suppose we have to wake up at quarter past four. So if you, if you think about it like that, 30 minutes isn't, isn't, isn't too much. But I, I suppose on the odd occasion when one is feeling a little bit tired, those extra 30 minutes will be absolutely glorious. I definitely know Final Control is going to be looking forward to those extra 30 minutes of sleep. Ah, there's a little stem book. We're not going to put the light on him, but you see, Brian might be able to catch. There we go. There's a female or male there, Brian? A female. A little female stem boogie. It's getting to that interesting time in the morning where it's, it's almost just too light to use the spotlight. So I think I'm gonna pop the spotlight down. Maybe just use it if I think I see tracks. Good morning to Ben in Leesburg. Uh, he wants to know, are there any water-bearing plants such as cactuses uh, like you have in the States? Hello, Mpalalas. So Ben, we do have some water-bearing water, water -bearing plants. Uh, most of those are, the water-bearing section is underground. We do have a recissus uh, vine that actually holds water. Uh, but uh, a lot of the animals will get their moisture just from the leaves that they eat. Also from the dew in the early morning, an uh, animal like a stenbok, which we saw a little bit earlier, is completely not dependent on water, and they get their water from digging up tubers in the grass and, and from other little plants, as well as from dew in the morning. You can see all the impalas' tails are working overtime, so after that little bit of rain and a few hot days, the fly population has exploded. So that's why you can see the little step, step, scratch, flick, flick, try to keep the flies off themselves. So we're gonna move on. Okay, so we've got some answers from the cheetah quiz. So a lot of you have said uh, Botswana and Namibia. Both are wrong. Uh, Serengeti, incorrect. Uh, well done to Lisa, uh, who is spot on. The largest measure population of cheetah left in Africa is the gr greater Kruger. So even though we might not see them all the time, we must remember uh, that there's a lot of areas in Kruger that are quite different to this. So the largest meta population of cheetah in Africa is the greater Kruger area. So that is fascinating. Now, one of the reasons why Botswana and, and, and Tanzania, the Serengeti or Masai Mara in Kenya comes to mind is because it's, it's a lot easier to see them there. Those vast open plains, you can spot a cheetah from a mile off. Here, they move through bush very similar to this, and uh, cheetah do not actually need huge open plains. They're just as comfortable hunting through mixed woodland like we, we, we drive through here. And uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but I will double check the, of the meta population of Kruger, but it is a couple of thousand in the greater Kruger area. So 
while we continue to check very carefully on our eastern boundary. Uh, let's jump across to Jamie and see what she's up to. And while Brent checks the eastern boundary, we are checking the western boundary, seeing if maybe we can follow up on where those Nkuhumas went from yesterday afternoon. They were lying up just to the left of me with Scott, and I'm just trying to work out exactly where they're gonna have gone from there. Now, I figure after a long, hot day with fairly full bellies, they probably, their first mission for the evening was going to be water. Doesn't look like they've crossed towards Simbambili and One-Eyed Pan, which leaves us with two other options. One, they went towards Galago Pan or Buyatela Dam, or two, they went to Sydney's Dam. It's just a question of us figuring out exactly where it was they went. A couple of tricky patches of soil where it's difficult in this light to catch a glimpse of where we think they've gone. I'm sorry that we had to cut our snake segment short. He was a fascinating little creature. It was just that there were people trying to get past us and I didn't want him to be in any way injured whilst under the wheel. So we had to do some very gentle and careful work in order to make sure that that wasn't the case. And um, he slithered off absolutely unharmed. As to our mysterious little snake's identity, I know quite a few of you have been sending through suggestions and we do say a big thank you for that. It's an interesting one. My initial thought was to agree with Chris Rogue and a couple of others who suggested Black Thread Snake, which is what I said initially. What really threw me off though was that yellow sort of sheen around the face. And there's a couple of different snake species of that sort of very similar in, I suppose you could call it the general impression of size and shape. There's tiny, tiny little thing, probably only about, I don't know, about seven inches, maybe even less, and very, very thin, very narrow snake with that black glossy color. For those of you who were suggesting the possibility of a Biberon's blind snake, his eyes didn't look right. I mean, he had quite well-defined clear eyes from what I could see looking over Andrew's shoulder into his viewfinder. Now, a tricky one, in the dark with a light on, Scott is in FC having a look as well to try and figure out if he can guess what snake it is. And he's on his way to get a snake book apparently to try and figure this one. The wolf snake is also not a bad guess. Wolf snake did cross my mind, so we'll have to see whether or not that is the case. But an interesting one nonetheless. Be curious to figure out what it is. We will let you know as soon as we confirm exactly what it is. I hope, I know I can rely on you all to take lots and lots of screenshots. Well, this is where the lions were yesterday. Lots of impala. And impala hiding in the bushes there, which suggests to me that the lions have not stuck around. They've moved off somewhere. It's not uncommon to see impala or any of the actually, actually any of the prey species hanging out where lions or in close proximity to lions. So if you ever come to visit the park, don't be fooled if you see impala around and think orkudu or any of those general game animals. Don't be fooled into thinking that it means there's no predators out and about because usually it's actually better the predator you see than the one that you don't because it's usually the predator that you don't see that gets you. And of course, snakes being one of those particular types of predators and Joey, you were wondering where, what the most number of snakes I've ever seen in one go, one place has been. I think Ingers is coming to, is doing an impressive job of racking up the species number, but I assume you mean at one time as well. Joey, I'm trying to think. I've seen mating cobras before, where I saw about four of them together. One that had actually managed to clasp the female and then two attending males is what I assume was going on. But that is probably the most I've ever seen and that only ever happened to me once. It was in a reserve far from here, around a 
place called All Days, if any of you are familiar with South African geography, right up in the northern part of the country, very close to the Botswana border. And of course, as predators, snakes are one of the most highly evolved. And like lions, certain species of them are ambush predators. And then others are active searchers, so active hunters. Something like a gaboon viper or a puff adder would be considered an ambush hunter. And then active hunters would be a black mamba. It's almost comparable. It's almost like saying some are like leopards and lions in that they ambush their prey. And some are like wild dogs that go out in search of it. Or hyenas, for example, which is the tracks that had me fooled there for a second. Michael would like to know, since we're chatting about snakes, and hopefully we'll be able to find some more, more snakes for you on our bush drive slash walk. Michael, you wanted to know what our largest species of snake is on Juma. Well, the answer to that is the African rock python. Now, it's been a while since we've managed to get one on camera. I think the last one was with Steph, and it was quite a young one. Quite a, still quite a small one. But of course, they can grow to be absolutely enormous in size. Uh, I've been reading interesting research because there are always rumors that the African rock python can grow up to six meters, reports of monster snakes. And authors are starting to suggest that that's not quite the case because once they hit sort of the two, two and a half meter mark at that sort of age, rather than growing in length, they actually grow in width. So they expand more and more in size. And the largest rock python I've ever seen was probably almost, I want to say almost as thick as my body. Whoopsie. No, Mahindra doesn't want to steer itself. Probably about that wide. So I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't immediately think of a good comparison, but that would be the largest snake that we would find out here. The other large species, something like a black mamba, maybe a cobra. Um, <clears throat> they tend to grow to be very large snakes, very long snakes, particularly snouted and spitting cobras. And of course, that black mamba we saw the other day was absolutely enormous. A very, very large snake. Some buffalo have walked down this road. That's a good sign. Could well be trailed by lions. <laughs> And love free dogs. You're saying that you're really starting to enjoy the drives on the Mahindra. I'm glad you do. It does give a little bit of a different perspective. And in a way, I guess it must feel more like a conversation. I'm just very impressed with Andrew and his ability to hold the camera and bounce around on the dashboard and not go flying off somewhere or backwards. And Brian would like to know where Andrew is sitting. And Brian, Andrew is currently placed upon the dashboard in a very whoop, precarious position. He's now sitting on the door. That is, that is where Andrew's bottom goes, in a nice little groove made, <laughs> made perfectly for Andrew. <laughs> and that is where he is seated, with his feet on the seat. And we've got a roadblock, Andrew. Oh, no. oh, no. Don't go flying off as we navigate the roadblock. And it's certainly given our cameraman license to be quite inventive with the way that they, or well, the types of shots that they compose. I guess for them, it's an interesting one because they don't just have to focus. There you go, and are giving you a, a lower perspective on this fallen knob thorn that looks as though it has been at some point thoroughly annihilated by elephants, but I think has just blown over. There's no leaves or anything. But yes, a testament to our cameraman skill. I know that you have sent through a question. You'll have to bear with me because occasionally around Sandy Patch, our 
communications, especially for some reason on cloudy days. I don't know how radio waves get affected and things happen and the signal dis or the, the communications disappears. So as soon as I can actually clearly hear your question, Zoe, I will be straight on to answering it. through that time so Zoe you were saying that you would love to have a job similar to ours and you would like to know sort of how we came to into this particular position and what our what our position is called and I guess for me I in at Wild Earth which is a first for me not something I ever thought I'd be doing I guess my best description would be a presenter in this particular context but for all of the presenters we are first and foremost field guides that is what our actual profession and actual career is the presenting aspect is something that's sort of evolved in the way that we do things and we all arrived here in different ways and I'm sure Brent will tell you his story as well I was working in an area not far from here as a guide for volunteers and for research students so I was taking people trying to do their PhDs Ah, and speaking of Brent, the wonderful Leo Smith is standing by. Jimmy, any traction or fire? Negative, I'm just checking around Sandy Patch City's dam area. Um, make sure they, oh hello. Hello guys. What's got you running, huh? What's stressing you out? Oh, so stressed. All right, girly. Okay, girly. My goodness. Ah, uh ah, -uh, girl. Nicely, girl. Sure. Just moving out of the way of that, Ellie. Now, unfortunately, with this mic, you won't be able to hear how much they're vocalizing. Wow! <laughs> well, that was an angry herd of elephants. My goodness gracious me, what was that about? Let's go investigate what that was about. Now, you'll notice I moved the car very, very quickly. The reason I did in that particular situation is with in that kind of mood and they were very stressed they were secreting from their temporal glands they were quite upset in that particular situation you want to be ready to move as quickly as possible now usually i'm very comfortable with letting elephants approach in that particular case they were absolutely furious obviously i'm not going to go follow them to try and get you another view that would be tantamount first of all to harassment and second of all would be foolish for both andrew and myself I must say, I'm quite glad I'm not on foot in that particular block. We would be making a very speedy exit in that case. Now what on earth has got them so cross that they've come sprinting out of Buffles Hook? Shame, even the little babies were stressed running around after mum. And that one cow just looked at us just in a way that made me and not concerned but just decided it was better for everyone if we just moved out of the way just let her know that we were going to move out of the way we were not intending to be there in her family's way but wasn't that interesting hey andrew yeah. <laughs> that, was, that just happened 30 seconds and it's over now there's a couple of different plausible explanations one is a big male big elephant bull in must that was harassing them and to the point that they decided to run another is i hesitate to say predators usually elephants actually respond to predators by trying to chase them away sometimes what happens with elephants is one of them panics and the rest of them kind of join in to this mass panic i don't know what that was about I really don't know totally bizarre Fascinating. Okay, Elise. Sorry, 
worry about your rough morning. The other possibility is maybe something like a tractor because we're quite close to, there's sort of two cut lines, one that runs along here with Buffel's hook and then one that divides Buffel's hook to the Mandaletti. And because it's a main access road, what could also have happened is something that they're not used to, a sound, a vehicle that they're not used to, a tractor, maybe something backfired, maybe a motorbike, anything like that might have led to that panic. It was just panic. And as I said, secreting from temporal glands, which is always a good sign of stress. And Amy, I thought about wild dog as an option. I thought about the option of wild dog. Uh, we've seen elephants reaction with them and usually they tend to chase the wild dog away and harass them rather than running straight away from them. I think it's a big bull and I'm wondering if it's not the big male that I saw when we were driving in or when I was driving Brian and Jerry back from Hoodsprate yesterday afternoon. He was standing in a pan at Manuleti or in the Manuleti and he was big and he was in must, very big. I'm talking sort of 35, 40 years old with huge tusks. Probably one of the biggest tuskers I've seen since I've been out here. And I'd be curious to see, I just wanted to check this part of the boundary, but I'm gonna turn around and go back and investigate further or closer to the water. Definitely wasn't water-based though, whatever that panic was all about. Very interesting to see. It's one of those moments that is a good reminder to be constantly on alert around elephants. And you always want to avoid cases of misplaced aggression. Hmm, there's one I forgot about. So Scott and the lovely ladies in FC have been working furiously as to the identity of our mystery snake. And it was an East African shovel nose snake, or the post, that's what they suspected might be. I would love to show you a picture, but I think Brent's got my snake book. So you better ask him to show you. A shovel snout or a shovel nose snake has got a slight shovel to, it's, a, it's it based exactly what it sounds like. Its nose is slightly flattened to help it shuffle under the sand. Now there we go, and an identity that none of us hit upon. I completely forgot about the shovels. I completely forgot about shovel nose snakes. Oh, they're one of the snakes that target reptile eggs and are very good at burying their way either under sand or something in that vicinity. And take Gallagher shortcut, see if maybe the Uncahumas decided to come this way. But that's useful to know, there you go. I forgot about the shield snouts. And all of those, or very often those dark colored snakes have some kind of adaptation for burrowing or burying themselves in the sand and are usually nocturnal. I said no to the wild dog and I think I've just come across, oh sorry Andrew, getting in my head in, my, in your way. Oh no, it's a young hyena. That's what it is. These hyenas, they've been all over the place. Confusing. Now, a wild dog tracks look similar to hyena, but they don't have that crosswalk where the right front and the back left will fall next to each other. But they are very small in size. There you go, you've got a good example of the track. Oh, I think we should be able to get it with this light. You can have a look at the track that's in the <laughs> Andrew negotiating the bonnet. And the tracks that are going up this way, but it's just, I think it's just young hyena. One of the sub adults probably. Oh, I got very excited there for a moment. I thought maybe we had some wild dogs that might pop out and maybe they were the explanation for the elephant's very strange behavior. Mm. I still want to double check though. I want to actually hop out and really have a good look. 
And I think that while I do that so that I can investigate properly and concentrate properly, I'm going to send you back over to Brent and catch up with you very shortly. So, um, apparently we think that snake might be an East African shovel nose or shovel snout. Um, I'm going to try and have a look in the book I've got with me. Uh, in the mean, there we go, 108 in East African. I obviously haven't seen it, so you guys are going to have to let me know if it looks like the right one. That is the East African sh shovel snout. And it is. Yes. There we go. Yellow nose. A little white dot. So hopefully that's the one. And we'll have a look at the pictures a little bit later. So there's quite a few different uh, shovel snouts. The East African only occurs up here along the east coast, the northeast coast. Uh, and up into Kruger area, so it, it does occur here. Um, they're very seldom seen, they're very secretive, and uh, they generally live in loose sand where they burrow. So really exciting to see something like that. We are getting some fantastic reptiles this year uh, due to the dry weather. Oh, what tracks have we there? This is buffalo. Well, Jamie, in investigate those tracks. I'm doing a boundary patrol. Uh, we're almost finished with the southern boundary at the moment, and then we're going to head up to the western boundary, see if the Kahumas haven't possibly headed visiting the western sectors. Kuru bulls. <laughs> How's that little, little skip and a jump? It's quite a few. I can see three, four, five big kudu bulls. This one's the closest to us there. And they're walking off. Amazing. You see how he dipped his horns there to get under that bush. So you would think, living in thick bush like kudu quite often do, that those horns would be quite a hindrance. And you see how they've developed that very distinct. That's full of joy this morning. They're attacking the spike thorn with great vigor. a small brush with his horns. There we go. Look at that. So that is quite often dominance display. There you go. So oh, look at that. A little bit of sparring. You actually hear the horns knocking together. Now a really strange thing happens in the bush between kudus. It doesn't happen very often, but people will sometimes find carcasses of two male kudus that have managed to get their horns interlocked during a fight and obviously unable to pull them loose and they actually die from starvation when that happens or they get caught by lions. Well, this could get a little bit more serious. So kudu are non-territorial. So that's why we've got a nice big group of males here. This just looks like a bit of friendly sparring. And the only time they will fight seriously is when there's a female in estrus around. Also, no set breeding season. They will... Oh, he's got him by the neck. They will breed throughout the year. So you can have kudu babies all year long. So what probably 
prompted, even though this is a sort of semi-friendly sparring match, was the one on the left horning the ground and the bush. And it is a slight dominance display, so maybe that one on the right is just saying, listen, my friend, I'm more dominant than you are. Sometimes these little practice sparring sessions can get quite serious and quite quickly they can escalate. Definitely looks like the one on the right has got a few more tricks up his sleeve than the one on the left. You can see, oh, look at that. Isn't that incredible? See how they brace themselves, straighten their legs, almost lock their knees. Look at that, to not lose ground. I might have to snap a picture or two. I hope you guys are getting some good screenshots of this. So the right hand side is definitely the winner. Look at that pronking. I am the victor. Let me stand tall and proud. Isn't that a fascinating? Oh, look, there we go. That's just running for the joy of life there. <laughs> there we go. It's oh. Are they back to sparring a little bit? This is definitely one of the best kudu sightings we've I've had since I've been here. So they've changed places. So the one that was on the right is now on the left. Natasha agrees with me that these are magnificent animals. Oh, Natasha, it looks like they heard you there. <laughs> and uh, it's so awesome to see the kudu bulls and see kudu bulls out in the open, not disappearing into a thicket. too serious. Could you fight when they get very serious? Oh, it's getting up a little bit, but still nothing too hectic. Oh, off, off again on a running, jumping, playing spree. <laughs> Kicking the back legs out. So that's when you can see these the sparring is more for fun than for for keeps, so to speak. Move forward a little bit. But it looks like the game is over. Time to feed. Put up now, gone to eating. Oh, but there's another bull having a silly fun. <laughs> Lovely camera work, Brian. Oh, let's set the others off. Oh, look at that. 
Look at that. He's really sorting out that bush. And now he's going to do the, the hop, skip, and a let's dash through the bush. So Nicole says it minds. Oh, look at these guys. There we go. Next one. Running right in front of us. Nicole says it, this reminds her of uh, James and myself racing. Yo, see how they duck those horns so perfectly as they go through a bush? Boom, look at that. Almost flat on its back. And normally you see that fluffy white tail when they've spotted a predator. And uh, it's a danger sign. But now they're just extending it for a bit of fun. Oh, next one coming in, Brian. And two more coming in. Definitely, definitely my best sighting of Kudu at Wild Earth. Isn't this fantastic? That's that one there. Mike says he loves watching two Kudu do what Kudu do do. I think that's something like that. There we go, next one. Off on a charge. Off, they're just running everywhere. Where do we look? Where do we look? behind us now. Hello, boys. Full of the joy of life. Arizona is wondering if they did manage to get their horns entangled, off, off they go again, would I help them out or try to help them out? You know, more than likely I would end up damaging myself quite heavily if I tried to help them out. Uh, and it is nature, so I would not. I would let nature take its course. I'd probably wait patiently for lions and hyenas to arrive. Yeah, this Jamie's heard some Apollo alarm calling around the very gate. Jamie's heard some Apollo alarm calling, so I'm sure she's on her way to check that. But we're going to have a move a little bit. Let's just see if we can keep an eye on them. If we had to try to sort of follow them off road, I'm quite sure they would away from us. So, okay, it's been sort of perfect positioning at the right time. And, oh, pure luck, I guarantee, to get that incredible behavior. It seems like things have calmed down a little bit. There they go. So, what a wonderful kudu sighting. Definitely my best since I've been here. But, now, let's move on from Kudu and let's try find some big cats. How about Kudu Dudus? So, <laughs> good morning to none of your business who's watching on YouTube. And none of your business would like to know, which is quite strange because it's none of your business. Anyway, we'll carry on. Um, we'd like to know, are, hood, are kudu horns uh, solid or are they hollow? So they are hollow. So that layer you see there, that dark layer, is a layer of keratin, which is basically the same as your fingernails or your hair. And um, inside there, there is a bone. So they're, they're both solid and hollow. And so the, the, the external section is, is hair, keratin, and then there's a, a large bone on the inside. Safari Dean says, I'm nervous to drive about the kudu. Yes, I, I've had a, a, an unpleasant experience with a, a smaller spiral horned antelope jumping into my lap. I think a big male kudu would be a, a far worse experience, and I, I'll definitely not come out as well as I did after the Inyala.
So a very good morning to Gilly in Wisconsin. Gilly would like to know whether it's a cool morning. Well, Gilly, it's probably now around 75, 76 Fahrenheit. So it is a, a little bit chilly. Uh, nothing too bad. You can see I don't have a jersey on this morning at all. And I haven't, haven't yet. But it is a nice cool morning. I think it is going to be a scorcher. Uh, the sun seems to turn on at about 7 a.m. It sort of clocks up. It's sort of like they almost, you almost turn the thermostat up to 4. But for the moment, it is a very nice and cool morning. And that is probably why they are playing. Uh, not so unlikely that they would play in the heat. But uh, really nice to actually just be there for that moment this morning. So Jamie heard Impala alarm calling around the entrance gate to the Sarbi Sands. So we're slowly making our way towards there and checking for tracks in case the lions came south. of your business and uh, it says it really likes when their tails curl that white uh, really sticks out so it's supposed to stick out so if they saw a lion or leopard and they ran away lifting that white tail is a signal for all the other kudu and possibly some of the other animals around to get out of dodge because there's a potential predator around so that's why that sticks out so much and you can see that they're very camouflaged but when they're running, camouflage isn't such an issue. So they pop that tail up, and that's a, a visual signal to the other And there's a lion or a leopard close by. I think I, I, am, I am glass free for the moment and I, I hope to remain that way for the foreseeable future. So we, if we look up ahead, about on that ridge over there is where the Nkuhumas were last night. But let's jump on with Jamie and see if she's uh, got any updates on those Impala alarm callings. a very interesting experience. Well, this morning has provided a very interesting few moments. Andrew and I were busy setting up a sort of ground level view shot of a hornbill where we were distracted by alarm calls from the impala around Gowrie Gate. So we came racing through at high speed to check out what it was that was worrying them. And it turned out that they were alarm calling at a dog that was sitting in the yard watching them through the fence. I was convinced we were going to find the Nkuhumas or a leopard hanging around. They had that frantic tone that Impala only get for lions and leopards or cheetahs sometimes. And unfortunately, it turned out to be just a dog that was watching them through the fence a bit confused by all that was going on. But interesting to see that behavior that you were watching with the kudu, as soon as the Impala realized that they weren't actually under threat, they then raced off and started playing and rutting with each other just in the same way you were watching with the kudu. I just want to answer Brent's radio call. Sorry, Brent, please repeat. Uh, are you on Triple M at the moment? Negative, I'm on where Tiller main access. Um, those alarm calls were at a dog. Okay, copy. I uh, long just the visual of a uh, feeding herd moving towards where Tiller main access, probably around the pans, uh, just to the north of one pan. Copy. 
copy that. Thanks. Have you, are you on Triple M at the moment? Hey, Phil, I'm just double checking what the flag is. Copy that, yeah. I'm still trying to work out where these and Gallo have gone. So Brent and I are just Copy. planning our routes and he says that he can see the elephants that we saw earlier somewhere around where we are now. He says he's watching them from Triple M and he can see them around the sort of the pans of this particular area. So keep your eyes peeled, Andrew, and all the viewers for our breeding herd that hopefully have decided to relax again since they've done their wild sprint through the bush. I was going to get Andrew to hop off and have a look at that termite mound, but I think I'll, we'll stay on the vehicle for now until we've established exactly where they're hiding. Somewhere in the bush here. I can't believe those Impala led us on a wild, what did you call it? It's not really a wild goose chase. A wild Impala chase. Or a wild leopard or lion chase. these elephants and I'd really love to be able to find them for you so that I can show you those temporal gland secretions. Wingnut wants to know how long does it take an elephant to start secreting. So essentially for those of you unfamiliar with elephant anatomy they've got glands as the name suggests around their temples and they secrete a, a common, it's a liquidy substance that contains a combination of hormones and pheromones, tells the other elephants exactly how they're feeling and what their reproductive state is, for example. Wingnut, it actually happens unbelievably fast. I'm not sure about the biology behind it, but I've seen elephants go from completely dry-faced to secretions all the way down their cheeks in the space of, I would say, less than, less than a minute. It, especially, and it, we, have a look, because we will get while you're watching, at some point, we will get another elephant interaction, either with other elephants stressing them out, or with, for example, wild dogs. Sudden exposure to wild dogs, and that's particularly what I was thinking about in that sighting, where the female, when we first encountered her, when we were following the wild dogs, was completely dry-faced, and within 30 seconds, the secretions ran all the way down her cheeks. So the amount of, or the speed of production of that substance is unbelievable fascinating to watch. Now both females and males do do it. I'm trying to work out where these elephants have gone if Brent says he can see them. I'm surprised. But both males and females do secrete from their temporal glands. Now the amazing thing, watching that elephant herd run through and run past us as they did, watching the little baby, there was a particularly tiny one sprinting, and it's always so much fun to watch baby elephants run, not less so when they're stressed like that, but you watch them stumble along, and you're, I'm always amazed at their ability to keep up with the rest of the herd. But Jen, you're actually wondering, what are the chances of an elephant trampling their young in that kind of situation? And Jen, I have never ever heard of it happening. It's one of those remarkable things about elephants is that they are so aware of their space around them. They do have special, the part of their brain devoted to spatial awareness is highly developed. So they're very aware, they have that proprioception around them. But I've never ever ever heard of an elephant trampling its baby. And I don't know if Scott is still in FC, if he's ever heard of a case of it or Brent has, I yeah, certainly yeah, haven't. Yeah, that was sounded standing by that almost uh, Brent's voice almost sounded like James there I mean, some there of the I uh, hit west and the bugs uh, then come down and then back north onto where it's headed um, probably heading towards and part of the plant itself I don't know what your position is I'm at Impala Plains at the moment. I haven't seen any tracks apart from Misi. Copy this. Tracks are literally heading straight towards Impala Plains from Triple M. This is fascinating. 
fascinating. So Brent's picked up on the tracks on Triple M. He said they're heading straight towards us. I've driven this road twice now and I have not seen any sign of the tracks come across. So I wonder if they're not still in this block somewhere. Maybe they made a kill last night. I'm going to double check and triple check that I haven't missed them, that all I've seen has been hyena tracks. Now this is where they crossed onto the property at some point yesterday. Maybe they went for a drink and then came back to a kill perhaps. It's good news though, it means that they're somewhere within our vicinity. I haven't, maybe those Impala were on edge and maybe that's what caused them to alarm call at the, at the dog. Maybe they were on edge because lions had been moving through the area in the night. Be an interesting one to investigate. I'd love to know what sort of impact that has on their, or how long the nervousness and the tension remains in an impala herd once lions have moved through the area and moved on. Be very curious to hear that. They must be here somewhere, unless they have somehow slipped across our without us noticing. Maybe they flew across the road. Sorry guys, just trying to concentrate as to where these lions have gone and I've been distracted by what I thought were lion tracks but it turned out to be hyenas. Fascinating. So Brent and I are basically coordinating our search in a in a pincer movement to try and see where these lions have gone. And our search for the Inkahumas is an interesting one because they could decide to have spent the entire night in this area or they could have moved all the way towards the Torchwood boundary. And that's the thing about lions is they can be fairly unpredictable in their movements and Declan who is 11 years old you're wondering sort of how far can a lion walk or how far can they move during a day if they, since they seem to sleep so much. And Declan it's actually astounding when they decide to move how far they how much ground they can cover I have to show you these tracks these beautiful leopard tracks. Just look at that. I'm going to hop out and join Andrew so I can see what you're seeing. And we can really get a nice perspective of scale. Jamie, do you have tracks there? Brent, I've just picked up Nkonzo for Mafazi Ingwe, right at the junction of the power lines and Impala Road. Here we go. Uh, okay, so let's have a look uh, at these properly. Copy that. You can hear Brent sneaking through. <laughs> there he goes. But let's have a look at these leopard tracks since they are such beautifully fresh little female tracks. Here you go. You can see the three lobes at the back that we always talk about. It. You can see them perfectly here. One, two, and three. And the perfect little female toes. There's nothing neater than a leopard track. And in this case, how do I know it's female? Just to give you an idea of the scale, it's not even the size of my palm. So my palm completely covers it. Now if we move a little bit further up the road and we track her a little bit, 
you can sort of get an idea. And I'm going to try and find a nice, clear example of how fast she was moving. And it looks to me like she was moving pretty fast. So moving from track to track. We move along here, there's the next one. This little track here is her back foot falling far from the front foot. So she, at this point, was on a mission. And I wonder whether it was not shadow from yesterday, moving away from where she had the kill. It could also, of course, be Karula. Or there's always the possibility of an unknown leopard. It's not one of the mating leopards. There's no sign of any male tracks. And the next one lands here, and then the back foot lands over here. And it goes off in a straight line, straight into towards the power lines. The nice thing that you can also see, although the light isn't ideal right now, but you can actually really see the difference in the shape of the different tracks. I'm going to draw it to make it clearer for you, or I'm going to circle them. This is not the best drawing stick though. But let's have a look. There's the front track, and her back track, which falls a little bit further, is shaped in a more pointy fashion. So just have a look at the difference in shape of those two circles and the difference in size of those two circles and you can really get a clear perspective of what we mean when we talk about the difference in size of the front and the back foot. So the front foot, the back foot is about half the size of my palm. Tiny little feet like that. My suspicion is that it's shadow and that she's moved all the way from where we saw her yesterday on the sunset safari and across here. Now, for those of you tracking masters, I hope you've been paying attention to what's around them as well, because that's equally important in telling us how fresh they are. So a nice soft sand like this, crispy clear, you can see how the lines of our shoes, how clear they are in the sand from where we've walked. So already that starts to tell us something. We know we've just made those tracks, so it tells us something about the soil type. It tells us that it holds the shape really clearly. And we can see that in the distinctness of the tracks, but they're not as crisp as our shoot prints. Uh, when we first started out this morning, the wind was blowing a bit. And I'll show you what happens when wind blows across a track in terms of obscuring it. There you go. That's what happens, that's how a track ages on a windy day you start to see the outlines being blurred. Now, unfortunately, Andrew is tied by cable because at the moment he doesn't have his backpack on. So we can't walk straight away along these tracks, but they go. Where do they go? This is where it gets tricky because I've driven over them. Silly, silly me. Took me a second to spot them. There they go. They're still with them. Still moving along here. And this is the last track that I can see. Moving straight up that way. One of Shadow's favorite paths. Nope, she's actually still on this road, still wandering up. My goodness, I think we need to go and investigate and figure out where exactly she's gone. So we're going to go for a little bit of a walk, see if we can track down this female leopard. Maybe there's a reason that those impala were so on edge. Maybe a leopard was wandering through as well as the lions. We'll just have to investigate in order to figure it out. And while we do that, let's get an update from Brent. Eat someone else. So welcome back. Not sure what happened there, but we're back. And uh, we are moving down Zoe's road. So Jamie's got those female leopard tracks that were heading parallel to us. And also the lion tracks were heading in this area. So hopefully we are able to find some tracks or even better find the animal. A very 
interesting question from Shamrock. With the leopard mating that's been recently observed uh, and the very dry conditions we are facing, is it possible that uh, the female leopards, uh, from a uh, genetic or instinctive point of view, will be less fertile uh, during these dry conditions? I don't think so, Shamrock. Uh, also, not to say that it has any effect, I think the, the Easter cycles and that are, are run normally and, and the current conditions won't play a part. Uh, the, the animals' individual condition will play a part. So if anything, they will probably more than likely, more likely to, to, to breed at this time because remember drought is good for lions, leopards and things like that. Bad for impala and wildebeest, but your predator populations actually increase during times of drought because of the herbivores being not so strong. And a lot of all the weak, the sickly ones have become even more weak and sickly and far easier to catch. So, uh, although I don't think it actually has any correlation whatsoever, um, if it did, it would actually probably increase breeding. So the reason it's, it's, it's good for the predators is that it becomes far easier for them to catch something. Uh, especially if they're a little bit out of sorts. And has Jamie gone through here already this morning? It looks actually Do those look like Mahindra tracks to you? No. So she might still be up this side, so we're going to pinch her towards her. And then no tracks of lion or leopard here. A very warm welcome to DJ Lister in Arizona. Morning, DJ. Would like to see a marula tree. There's one right there next to us here. That's a marula tree. No fruit on that one. Just stopping to listen for a second as well while we show you that marula. Good morning, you're from, uh, you're from uh, so, so, if you have a look carefully, there's more marulas to the left. Uh, and the bark's quite distinct. You can see it's almost like patchwork as we go past these. A small one. You can see it's almost like a patchwork, but very distinct shape. Uh, very round leaves, uh, bipinnate leaves. Here we go. So little branchlets with multiple uh, leaves opposite each other, and of course when they're fruiting, very very distinct round fruit on them. Very soft wood, not a hard wood at all. Uh, why they're often pushed over and broken by elephants. But once they get big enough like those, uh, it's unlikely the ellies will be able to push them over. So look. So a Kyle who's 15 years old in the Great Lakes district, he's from Michigan, is saying he can do a better hyena sound than I can. Well, Kyle, if you can, 
take a video, pop it on the Safari Live Facebook page, or pop it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Um, so now, Carl, it all depends on what hyena sound. So hyenas have a vast range uh, of different vocalizations, and that they mean lots of different things to the hyenas, of course. And interestingly enough, almost 80% of vocalizations in most areas are made by males and completely ignored by everyone. But when one of the dominant females calls, uh, the, the whole clan reacts very smartly. I'm going to give you a few shortly. I just wanted to idle out onto the open Impala Plains and see if there was any sign of either the lion or the leopard. Here we go. No tracks. Just one lone wildebeest track on the road. saying hyenas make lots of different vocalizations. The most common one um, that we hear is the whoop, which is just generally a contact, how are you doing call, sort of a, and, and they can vary. I mean, I've heard hyenas that almost sound like they're saying woohoo, but uh, the normal one, the one that's sort of synonymous with the African bushveld is that long whoop. Very seldom do you hear that perfect whooping sound. It's more sort of whoop. Um, but, uh, and those are actually the sounds that hyenas make the most, and also that sort of lowing, sort of uh, but the one that everyone knows is that maniacal cackling when they're excited or feeling threatened. I can't do that. Can you do it, Brian? Mm. Here we go. Let's see. Brian's far more of a master of the, the voice box than I am. So let's, let's, uh, Brian's now trying to think. So that sort of maniacal cackling. Mm, this is a difficult one. Well done, Kyle. Well, we'll, we'll give Brian a few a few moments. Uh, I definitely know I can't do it. Let me just let me just see where Jamie is. Jamie, Jamie. out here on Safari Live. Are you, are you ready, Brian? I'm ready. Okay. On three. One, two, three. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that sounded more like a horn ball. <laughs> guys, I'm going to head back to the last tracks. There's no lion tracks crossing uh, the roads to the north, so they're probably still in this block just to the east of me here. So let's go see how Jamie's going with those leopard tracks, and I'm going to shoot towards the last lion tracks and take a quick walk. Guys, just 
come and have a look at this. We've been following up on the leopard tracks, but I got completely distracted. I'm going to show you why. It seems to be something of a snake-themed morning. Just have a look at what is hiding in this termite burrow. Now, this snake skin of a very large snake, judging by the condition that it's in, I would say that it's been shed quite a while back. But I wanted to show you, before I pulled it out, I wanted to show you what the position we found it in. And there's a reason behind that. So when snakes lose their skin, let's try and duck under here. When snakes lose their skin, it starts at around their face. And what essentially happens is they become almost completely blind. And they feel particularly vulnerable during that time. And essentially it's because all of their body resources have been thrown into growing because that's why the shedding happens. It's to allow for them to grow because their skins and their scales can't. So they have to produce new ones underneath that old layer and then slowly expand and push the snake skin off. As you can imagine, that takes a lot of energy. If you combine the fact that they go essentially blind in the beginning, it starts around the, the face and the nose and they usually rub their nose up against something to help get that process started. You can see why hiding in a termite burrow like this one would provide the perfect refuge for them. And since we've had a look now, I'm actually going to pull it out and have a look at what I think it might be. I'm going to do so carefully. I don't think the snake is still in here, but you just never know. Oh, it's very much still attached. <laughs> and he's and shot back about five, five meters. <laughs> <laughs> it's attached. It's not. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's made me laugh so much. It's not actually attached to a snake, I don't think. I'm not going to test that theory. Oops, there's a branch there, Andrew. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> but it is fascinating. No sign of the actual snake. But it's very stuck, and I don't really want to break it off, but I have broken off a little bit of it. Now a snake like this, with scales like we have here, my guess would be somewhere in the region it's one of the smooth scales, not a rough scaled snake. And if we have a look at the skin that we've got in this beautiful light, you can really get a close up view of the way that the scales overlap. Now with smooth scales like this, my guess would be something along the line of mamba or cobra. But isn't it beautiful in its own way? I know a lot of people have that very natural atavistic instinct about snakes. But the, the, you have to marvel at their design, the smooth scales of the underbelly. It's all such a fascinating process. And just think, somewhere in the last few, I'm not sure, last few weeks, last few days, a snake shed its skin in there, took refuge in this termite mound, and that's where it wanted to hide. And it found a very good spot. And this is actually, gives you a nice perspective of what it's like to be at this level, what it's like to be a leopard. They love to hide under these magic quarry bushes. This is where we, the sort of area that we see leopards in all the time. It gives you an interesting perspective of what it must be like from their point of view, looking out at the world through that. And since we are doing a bit of a snake themed morning, Liz, you were wondering, since the drought does benefit predators, does it benefit something I mean, like leopards or lions? Does it benefit something like a snake? I'm trying to decide what I think about that and whether or not it would. They're far less water dependent, of course, than any of the other animals. So they're not really in any way negatively affected by the lack of drinking water. They, that, that's of course partly to do with their reduced body size and the fact that their kidneys work extra hard to make sure that they don't have to have a bladder in which to store urine and essentially concentrate it so much that it turns into that uric, um, that solid uric acid form that you see for example in bird droppings, the white stuff around bird droppings. Does it help them? Does it benefit them? 
Oh, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. I think probably it does in the same way that it helps to, or their, their hunting grounds are sort of narrowed down to around water sources, but maybe if it takes animals away from their territories or the areas that they move in, it might be harder for them to follow. This, I'm not sure. I'm gonna think about it a little bit longer and tell you what, what opinion I, or what conclusion I come to. But we do have a leopard to track. We just got a little bit distracted by snake skins in termite mounds. Plus my legs are starting to freeze. <laughs> we slowly back away from the termite mounds. And love three dogs. I wish we could have been able to show you this particular snake. Love three dogs has said that we should start a snake list as well as our bird list and I'm hoping that spider hunting wasp is going to come back so that we can show you it. And absolutely, I mean, I didn't even think of checking in the tree for the snake, which probably should have been my first port of call. I should have had a solid look before we went and poked around in there. I don't see any sign of it hiding in the boughs of the tree. Doesn't mean that it isn't there. It'd be fascinating to know. It's one of the wonderful ways that we can actually experience the world on bushwalk is because we get to see these things up close and personal but I'd love to know how many snakes we drive past in a day and I mean visible snakes snakes that we could possibly see we just miss because they're so well camouflaged or so cryptically hidden in the trees now what I'm going to do because Brent is busy tracking is I'm going to help load or help Andrew load up we are right next to the car because I was going to drive to the next road junction in order to track down this leopard so we're going to, oops, hold on, stuck on the window. There we go. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Behind the scenes view indeed. The operation of, essentially what you're getting here is the behind the scenes view of the way a tracking team works. Because this is exactly how we would operate. And yes, we would usually get distracted by something like a snake skin in the termite mound. Oh, don't, don't fall down, Andrew. Andrew's making me so nervous. He's wandering around like an acrobat on the bonnet. And I just have visions of him tumbling off. Should get danger pay, Andrew. Now Joseph has asked a really, really valid question. He wants to know, how many snakes do we have in Africa? And Joseph, I've been trying to work that one out. Um, I'm really struggling with it. Be trying to work out, first of all, how many snakes we have just in Southern Africa and expanding it from there. I'm guessing we probably, in Africa, probably around the 400 mark, but please don't take that as a definite. I would have to double check. Maybe you guys, if you have access to the internet, just have a look and see if there's any details about how many snake species there are. I mean, within the Sabi sands alone, we have such a wide variety. And just off the top of my head, I can think of easily up to 100 snakes that occur in this region. You can sort of flip through a snake book and get a rough idea, but that's just in Southern Africa. And I can just imagine how the rainforests and those sorts of areas would be filled with snakes, making a full use of that closed habitat. Now keep your eyes peeled. Shadow loves this block. I know Shadow fairly well, or I fancy that I do, in terms of her movements in this area. Do I know it's Shadow? No, I, it could be either Shadow or Karula. Although, to my knowledge, Karula was otherwise occupied. I suspect it's Shadow. But it would be interesting, either way, we've got to find this leopard, because now we've got to find out, is it still Karula? Is she mating still? Or has she decided to move on with her nose slightly out of joint because Tundi was, she had to share the mail with Tundi, her daughter. I can imagine that could be slightly off-putting for her. I would have loved to have seen that interaction. It's the most fascinating thing I've heard of. Days of our lives drama. And Shadow loves these thick spots around here in the, just like what, the tree that I showed you. Those gwari bushes. 
to me at least he wanted to know a little bit about pan oh sorry it's tamsy tamsy pan um you wanted to know how long safari live has been going on and i'd just like to say welcome since i haven't heard your name before i don't know how long you've been watching safari live but you wanted to know roughly how long safari live has been on for oh my imagination's making leopards out of logs and Tamsi, it's, it's been an on and an off thing since about 2007 and it has operated in different areas and in different ways. It started out, the Wild Earth Project started out as cameras set up on the dam sending pictures, updating pictures many, many years ago. Around 1998, I believe, was the first, one of the first cameras that went up. And it has evolved in the most incredible way since then. And we've been so fortunate, all of the crew that is working for Wild Earth at the moment, we've been so fortunate to have been in the position that we're in, in the last two or so years, where we've seen such a rapid expansion. We've been playing around, experimenting with new things, backpacks like the one we have for the bushwalk, Drones, as flown by Drone Commander Andrew Francis, who is currently conducting your camera experience this morning. And at present, all kinds of other exciting things that are in the works. Let's put it, let's put it as in the works. It's been the most phenomenal evolution of a concept that I think is probably one of the most incredible concepts I've ever heard of in the world. To be able to take people from around the globe and so they might for some reason or some circumstance be completely unable to go on safari or they have been on safari and they've loved every minute of it and they want more. What an awesome way to actually be able to bring it to people in that kind of context. It's the closest we can get to giving you a safari without actually being on safari. And what I'm quite enjoying about this is we get to jump off. So it's like being on a drive with an actual safari guide because now we can <laughs> as, Andrew, as Andrew disentangles himself from the cable. You're getting a sort of a, an interesting glimpse into the way that we operate. That was so nimble. Andrew just very gracefully descended right off here. But what I wanted to show you, whoops, okay, that was less nimble. That was, that, that was very me. <laughs> Nothing like tripping over a cable. You all know by now I fall over. I'm, I'm done being embarrassed about it. <laughs> and she's trying to get the cable. It's attached to the back here. Here we go. The millipede's escaping. The millipede's escaping. Well, as you can see, well, you can certainly see that we're live. For those of you who are ever in any doubt, a live safari, because you can't plan or edit or script, and sometimes I fall over much to the enjoyment of everyone watching. But we just, because this light is so incredible, I wanted to stop and show you this millipede. It was in the road, and it's the sort of thing that I would get my guests to do if I were conducting a safari experience. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning. For those of you who are sitting on the back of the vehicle through Andrew's capable hands, I want you to see the world as I would conduct a game drive. Coming for you, Andrew, he's charging. <laughs> Don't run, Andrew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something that's drummed into you as a trainee safari guide and that you then drum into your guests that no matter what happens out in the bush, you never want to go running away, even if it's a charging millipede. So millipedes or shungalolos are one of my favorite things and I've been researching a little bit about them. Can you come on my hat? You're gonna be my friend. Yay, look at you. And you can see how useful these segmented bodies are for actually being able to, 
reposition him, for being able to navigate the landscape. Imagine being the size of this millipede and wondering as he does around all of these obstacles. And you can see why this segmented body design is such an incredible one. Where are you going, little one? Don't walk on my monkey orange cuts. Okay. There, stretching out, being able to have that level of control. He wants to go to the camera. He's your friend. <laughs> Having that level of muscular control over his body. You can see he's not stressed in any way. If he was, he'd be curled up in a ball, in a defensive ball. At the moment, it's just like he's on a treadmill. Hey, a bit confusing, hey buddy? You're walking, but you're not going anywhere. It's okay, I'll put you back, I promise. Here we go, okay. You need to release my finger. Perfect example. You'll notice I picked him up with no problem, and in fact, they were one of my favorite things to explore and play with as a child. And Meredith, you were saying that you believe that there's differences between toxic, venomous, and poisonous. <laughs> Look at him go for Andrew. He wants to be your friend, Andrew, mm. even with the camera. And not a shy millipede. <laughs> but yes, Meredith, you are absolutely right. Toxic, poisonous, and venomous, and our millipede is the perfect example. You saw how I let him crawl all over my hands. Now, if he were a centipede, on the other hand, I would be, first of all, I have a, a slight, a slight, disagreement when it comes to centipedes. I don't get on all that well with them. But they're also what's known as venomous, which means they inject, either through biting or through stinging, they inject venom. This little guy, sorry, you wanna come on your treadmill again? Here we go. This little guy is poisonous. So he can't inject venom, he can't harm me in any way. But if I were to eat him, I would become very, very ill. And it's actually, a cyanide derivative that millipedes carry. There are only, only a few creatures that are capable of eating them. And I'm sure when you see them wandering about, you must think how terribly vulnerable they look, for, look to birds. And yet we never, hardly ever see a bird eating them. And that is because they are poisonous or toxic. So poisonous means if you eat it, you will get sick or die. Venomous means it has venom that it injects, either through biting or stinging. This little guy is, believe it or not, poisonous. And how fascinating that he doesn't carry that coloration that we usually associate with poisonous things. Usually something that's toxic to eat carries what's known as aposematic coloring. So black, right, black, white, red, orange, something like that, like a monarch butterfly or a... Oh, I can't believe I can't think of another example. <laughs> Coral snakes, something like that. Usually carry warnings to say, hey, I'm dangerous. And then of course you get the really cunning species that have evolved to mimic that kind of thing. So they mimic the coloration and pretend to be poisonous. Such a funny feeling. I wish you were here so that you could experience what it feels like to have a millipede wandering along your body got this gentle, their, their feet are so incredibly light and gentle, it's hard to describe. Just a gentle tickling, they're almost weightless. And so fascinating to see their way that they're moving waves. So something that I learned that I'd like to share with you, their legs are paired for the most part of their body. The only exception is the first four segments. So when I talk about a segment, of course, I talk about each little bit. Hey, thank you. Yes, show them your legs. Mm. <laughs> Good boy or girl or whatever you are. But at the fourth segment, so difficult to show you because he doesn't really keep still. That's because he's very confused as to why he's walking and getting, oh, look, there's a mite on him, a tick thing. Here. Can we see it? I can't see. Where'd it go? Come back. <laughs> Shame. All right, buddy. It's okay. It's on the, uh, the tick's on the other side, but he's not... I'm not going to manhandle him to get it into view. But yes, at the end of the fourth segment is where their reproductive organs are. How fascinating is that? 
and Susan, since we're sitting watching and just investigating this little guy, Susan was wondering how many legs he has. And the answer is, it differs from, it. it's not necessarily the same for every millipede, so it differs, they don't ha always have the same number of legs, whether or not they're from the same species. But you're looking at about, with this guy I would guess at, probably somewhere in the region of about 120. Not, Rough. A, not a million. Not a million, not a million millipede legs. Hey millipede. <laughs> Somebody's going to come around the corner and think I'm completely nuts. And Lauren? Lauren is watching in Australia where they have millipedes. <laughs> I love that shame. Let me put him down. I'm starting to feel like maybe he should be allowed to go on his, on his way. But Lauren, oh, there's a spider there. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny little spider. Where did it go? There it is. Oh, count the millipede. One of the little, doesn't look like a jumping spider. I've seen quite a few of them wandering around and hunting termites. You still see it? Yeah, it's just, there it is. Well done, Andrew. Oh, where's he gone? I took my eye off him for one second and yeah. he vanished. <laughs> Spider playing hard to get. But Lauren, who's watching in Australia, you wanted to know, are the millipedes as smelly as the, one that you, as the ones that you get there? And they are capable of secreting quite a foul smelling substance when they're stressed in particular. Um, what they then do is defecate on you, which happens a lot when you're a kid and you play with them and it does smell. But they don't, they don't smell badly in situations like this where you're just letting them relax and move over your hands. Perfectly, perfectly calm. Just realized I'm sitting in a, an impala bin. <laughs> Little bit of pile of impala dung. And yes, as I said, they are poisonous and for none of your business. Hey, look, there's going to be a collision between two millipedes. They generally tend to ignore each other unless they decide to mate. Now watching them, we've said they're poisonous, but both none of your business and Wayne have said, but what actually would eat them? And the biggest predator of millipedes out here is a little nocturnal creature that we don't always get to see, and I would be very, very excited. Ah, oh, they've just missed each other. <laughs> Mil like ships passing in the night, except they're millipedes blindly passing in the day. You gonna, oh, it's gonna catch up. Is it gonna catch up? It's a race, it's a race. Come on, buddy, you can do it. Oh, got distracted by a, a roadblock. Ah, oh, turned away from its mission. We'll not get to see how these millipedes would have interacted today. So what eats them? The answer to that is civets. Civets are the main predators of, um, of millipedes in this way. And you'll actually find if, I'm trying to think where the closest civet tree is. So civets deposit their dung, or their feces actually is what it's known as, because it's a combination of plant matter and um, animal matter. So it's feces, it's a combination for an omnivore. They usually deposit it in regular piles and they actually walk fairly regular highways and they leave their tracks all around the reserve but we just haven't managed to catch up with one of them and actually put it on camera. Apparently you saw the track with Brent two days ago and uh, you saw a civet tree where they deposit their dung and if you look at their, f oh, their feces, sorry, if you look at their feces they've got exoskeletons of millipedes sitting in it and what I'll try and do for you is I'll look for it, I'll look for some as we carry on. I think we should carry on though, as fascinating as this millipede segment has been. Haha, <laughs> segment. <laughs> um, and let's see if we can catch up with this leopard. I want to go and check that termite mound that she loves, and she loves to walk along that path. And while we go and check, and I assist Andrew by tripping over his cables in order to get back into the car, let's pop over to Brent and get an update from his side. <laughs> So we're still on those line tracks. They've crossed into Arethusa. So we're on Arethusa at the moment. We've just done a wide circle, uh, checking that they haven't come out of this next block, and they haven't. 
uh, and the other vehicles just called in. They found lots of hyena on Parallel Road, which is the road that runs parallel to Triple M, where we found those tracks. So I'm hoping that maybe the lions have a kill in there, and the hyenas are just standing back. So we're going to go have a look there now. Welcome to Anna McDougall. Uh, Anna McDougall is wondering, do lionesses ever leave their natal pride and form female coalitions? Uh, not really. They don't form female coalitions. What happens when prides get very big, sort of 15 adults and above, even, even 10 adults and above, uh, sometimes two or three of the lionesses will splinter off and form a new pride. Uh, they are still obviously related to their natal pride, so they often share similar home range or territory, uh, but it's not a coalition. They go form a new pride. Um, can be two, can be three, can be five. It just depends on how big uh, the original natal pride is. Come on, Brian, spot us a lion. So the tracks moved in from about there, heading west. There's quite a lot of drainage lines in here, and those hyenas are probably about where my finger is now, so we're going to loop around on the road and get back there. So, a uh, big thank you to Kyle, and well done, Kyle. I can't wait for the end of drive uh, to see your hyena impression. Uh, I'm very excited for that. I think I'm probably going to giggle or cackle like a hyena on viewing it. So Dylan in Iowa, morning Dylan. Dylan would like to so know, is it true that the best seat on a safari bed is the middle? Uh, saw that on a website. Well, uh, Dylan, it's my least favorite seat in a safari bed because often you've got a person on either side of you. Uh, for me, the best seat is to have a whole row of seats to yourself so you can move from side to side. But uh, strange enough, I'd probably say the best seat in the house is any of the three directly behind the guide. Uh, well, it's a bit of a toss-up. The best viewing seat is the back. Sorry, Dill, I'll be back with you now. Standing by, Trist. Just triple M so far, and I've gone to Red Dam, past the pump house now, heading back towards Sima Media. There's a cut line, still no tracks. Um, I'm gonna go check parallel again now. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, just double double checking. Um, everyone's searching for these lions. And so for me, Dylan, it's probably the best seat is the one directly behind the guide. Um, firstly, because you can pretty much hear what the guide's saying most of the time. But uh, a lot of people love the back row. So the back row is definitely the best from a game viewing point of view because you hire, you get to spot stuff. But it's also the most uncomfortable uh, being off the edge of the vehicle. The bumps can be quite hectic there. So it all depends what you want. And if you're not short, just take the middle row and then you'll be fine. wondering what is the coldest it ever gets in South Africa. Well, Tristan, it depends where you are. Uh, the, probably the coldest we will ever get in the Sabi Sands is zero degrees Celsius, which is, I think, around 30 Fahrenheit. 
30, 32, somewhere around there. Uh, but in other parts of South Africa, up in the mountains, it can get to minus 5, minus 10 even, uh, up in the high mountains. And it does slow occasionally in the high sections of the Drakensberg. So I'm not sure what minus 5 or minus 10 is in Fahrenheit. But that's degrees C. This morning. So, and speaking of all these spider webs that I'm fighting with, they're getting attached to our radio area. Tansy Tan would like to know oh, all over me, uh, what type of spiders do you guys get up here? Um, lots of different types. We've got jumping spiders, we've got orb spiders, we've got um, widow spiders, we've got violin spiders, we've got sack spiders, uh, we've got daddy long legs, uh, we've got crab spiders, we've got... Brian, any you want to add? Don't remember now. But we have a huge host of different spiders. Uh, and the more common ones we see are, are jumping spiders and orb spiders. But we've got lots, lots, probably thousand different species of spiders here. Okay, so the last tracks those lines were just over here. So we're just gonna go really slowly through that. Michael Fleet was wondering how long do the Inkahumas uh, normally stay on the property? And sorry guys, it's gonna be on the radio again. Standing by? So I've just switched off now, I'm on parallel. Okay, so we just had a report that there might be some parallel alarm calling up ahead of us. They might have stopped. So we're just going to keep going slowly down the road. Um, Ah, I see. We have Tristan behind us. So we're all searching in the same area. So we're going to jump across to JB while we try to find these lions. Uh, and hiding behind that silver cluster leaf tree, raiding nests, is an African harrier hawk. Now the drongos have just shot forward to go and chase it away. It's definitely on the hunt. There it's gonna come out. Being mobbed by the fork-tailed drongos. A battle of boldness here between the bird species and drongos are particularly good at it. There he goes. And the drongos have emerged victorious. Let's go see if we can catch up with them. If maybe they will give us another view of that harrier hawk. One of the ones that we very seldom get to see behaving naturally. For some reason, they're particularly skittish. Of all the raptors, they're one of the hardest. They don't really sit still, maybe because they're mobbed all the time by the birds. But they are mobbed for good reason, because they go and they raid the nests and they kill the chicks and the eggs of other bird species. And that's what this one's currently doing. It's trying to get at the eggs or the eggs of the chicks. I see you, I see you. I'm gonna give it plenty of space. Let me think we're able to get it there, Andrew, where I, from where I parked. It's a whole different experience on the Mahindra. Ow. 
although we do have wonderful views of it unfortunately our camera and our system needs a bit of a reboot so we're going to pop over to Brent quickly and we'll catch up with you as quickly as possible so we're just sitting and listening carefully see if we can hear those impala alarm calling again and uh so far the bush is very quiet there's a couple of the birds tweeting around and on the subject of tweeting if you want to tweet us a question feel please feel free and uh, just use the hashtag safari live uh, for those who might be late who just joined we're in search of the inkahuma pride their tracks have crossed onto arathusa and we've heard an impala alarm calling another vehicle seen a group of hyenas so we're wondering whether they've actually caught something somewhere around here so not only are we listening for those impala alarm calls we're listening for the growls of the lions that are killed and as i often say ears are quite often much better at locating animals than your eyes the sounds give you a place to start looking but all is quiet on the western front let us continue Sometimes uh, lions will be in an area for an extended period. It also depends with male lions uh, on the boundaries they feel the most threatened by. So that's the reason we don't see the Birmingham so often. But they spend a lot more time to the sort of south and east uh, on the Kruger Park boundary and on the edge of... What have I spotted? I've spotted a tracker. There we go. So quite often... On the, on the so there we go. He's up on foot looking for those lions. So always good to know. So what happens is you often see the trackers sitting on the front of the safari vehicles while we, we drive past the other vehicles. So what they do is often in a situation like this, where there's a good set of fresh tracks to follow, uh, the guide will drop off his tracker and off he'll go into the bush and the guide will drive around to make sure that tracks haven't gone even further. So, I know this I was saying this is a very narrow band of, of bush between Parallel Road and Triple M. So hopefully, if they haven't crossed into this much bigger block, Stanley White. There are you are, Kashba. Ah, copy. I just saw him. Um, I'll make my way back towards there. Thanks, Omash. Take my 
There we go. Well done. Tristan's tracker, the one we just showed you, has found the lions. So we actually nearly drove straight past them. And that's the thing. If these lions are lying flat, they can disappear. I can spot the tracker. He's calling us in with that wonderful wave of the arm. So uh, we, owe, we owe Tristan and his tracker. I'm not sure who his tracker is today. Uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a big thank you. So they've helped us find the ink rumors and they've saved me from having to walk around in the bush. And you can see he's got a catapult for lion protection. In case they get to get a bit cheeky, he's going to shoot them with his cat. How are you, mums? <laughs> nice to see you, mums. Nice to see you, mums. Nice to see you, mums. Are they just lala there? Yeah, just lala there. That's where the mala were yeah, coloring. Yeah, they're coloring. Okay. Yeah, Tristan should be there. Yeah. Uh, bitch, I'm a foot. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So look here. There's mums. You can see what a brave man he is. Everyone. And if we have a look straight through here, there's the Inkahuma pride. You see them run. They are watching us. So let's go have a look. We're going to let Mums jump on with Tristan. And let's go have a look. Shops and go Mumfo. So you can see how they were watching Mums. Um, they didn't run away. He says it looks like they're a bit mafuta, which means fat. So they've obviously had a snack. Oh, they've got a buffalo kill here. Um, there we go. It looks like they've killed a sub-adult buffalo that's behind them there. I love it when they got those dirty, bloody faces. So, oh, still only four of them. missing one lioness at the moment and it looks to be amber eyes i wonder if she's off mating with uh, one of the birmingham boys so you can see just behind them as brian zooms out you see that dark carcass there they've got a buffalo hello kitty cats So, as I was saying, in these drought conditions, we've noticed the lions taking down a lot more buffalo. And these will be either young, that looks like it could be an old cow. I'm just going to check in my binoculars quickly. What do you think, Brian? So, from what I can see of the horns, it does look like an adult female but she does look quite skinny. This carcass looks quite fresh, so it could have happened this morning. And they're very full already, so they have been hunting very successfully for the last little while. Look at that little moment of tenderness. That, uh, touching of faces and things like that's very important for lions, um, especially since when they start eating in earnest, they can become very aggressive with each other. Uh, being the only social cat, uh, those little moments are the moments that help them reaffirm the bonds between the pride, and obviously a close pride is a, a successful pride. Now, uh, look at this lady cleaning herself here. And she's been right into the stomach contents, and that's what's all over her face and her paws. So often, <clears throat> with a lot of the big cats, the first thing that gets eaten is the liver, lungs, heart, and lots of nutrients in there. And you can see they've now resting up. Still a lot of meat chairs, so that's good news for us. We can definitely have these lines for a day or two. A bit of a 
this tasteful something there. in Iowa is, thanks for another question, Dylan. Uh, Dylan saw Mumps, Tristan's tracker, carrying a red thing, and I briefly mentioned that it was a catapult. Uh, Dylan would like to know whether it's similar to an ash bag. Uh, quite the opposite, Dylan. It is a, a catapult, so if the lions get cheeky, Mumps will fire marula berries at rapid, a rapid rate towards the lions to keep them at bay. Um, so, no, not, not an ash bag. So Kim B is, can't get over how dirty this particular Inkuma lioness's face is. So Kim, that's a mixture of blood, stomach content, and probably a bit of soil as well. And you can see how she's now starting to clean herself. So she'll look pretty and priceless in a little while again. So Keith on Twitter is wondering why they're panting so heavily. Keith, it's because they've got full bellies. So they're, they're in the digestive process, it produces heat. And there we go, you can see she's not that full, but the others have a sort of extended bellies already. It looks like she might go have a feed. So no, still. Do you know what? I, this is probably quite a recent kill. So a combination of full bellies and, and exertion is the reason that they're, they're panting. You can see one of those wonderful full bellies. And when you're walking on foot after lions, that's what you look for. Because if they're sitting up, you can't see the color so nicely. Uh, but as soon as they lie down, that white underbelly shows up very nicely. Notice how that lioness is occasionally looking up to the sky. She's checking for vultures. Um, lions do watch vultures quite closely as they drop. And I think we might get a few vultures around this carcass. It's not in the thickest area, but it's still a bit early for the vultures to have got moving. So it is wonderful to have the Inkahunas regularly after a really long absence. challenge a pride like this, there needs to be multiple hyenas. There we go, look at that. <laughs> I 
So Genie on Twitter was worried about Mumps, the tracker. He said, my goodness, he was really close to those lines. Genie, Mumps is a very good tracker with lots of experience. And of course, he's got a catapult to defend himself. So he wasn't in any danger. So don't worry. Mumps probably uh, has walked more lines than we've seen on Safari Live. So I wouldn't worry about Mumps in the bush. Barbara's wondering whether the dirty lioness would be the one who did the actual throat hold and kill. Barbara, it's it's near impossible to say, and uh, normally not. That seems to be the one who got stuck into the belly first, and normally the one who's done the actual throat hold is quite tired. So she she isn't the first to eat. She's quite often the last to eat, uh, but from arriving at this sort of stage of a kill, it's near impossible for us to say. running earlier this morning and is it the reason possibly why they were running um Heidi it's not we're quite far away from there uh we're on Arethusa on the eastern edge of Arethusa but still probably about a kilometer and a half two kilometers from where those elephants were with Jamie this morning and it's going to start heating up quite quickly and don't lions are going to sleep very close to this carcass. They might drag that buffalo a little bit more into the shade. But I think it's going to be a very interesting sunset safari. And I think where these lions are are now on a different clan of hyenas at home range compared to the normal Juma clan. And these hyenas are far more aggressive than our Juma clan when it comes to lions. So it could be a very interesting sunset safari. Last year was quite a tough year. Um, they lost a couple of members being killed by the Birmingham boys, but now it's settled down a little bit. So hopefully towards the end of the year, we'll be seeing some cubs. are flat cats, but Jamie's got a feathered friend for you guys to look at quickly. And we're sorry to interrupt you, although thrilled. <laughs> thrilled to hear that you found the lions. And since my bird decided not to play nicely, <laughs> having sat there for about two minutes, I think I'm going to send you back a picture. <laughs> Bless you, Andrew. I think I'm going to send you. <laughs> Bless you, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew says, sorry, everyone. He got dust up his nose. I'm going to send you back across to Brent. I'm making my way to some pans to have a look what we find there. So we'll catch up with you shortly when we actually have something that hasn't flown away. So we're just popping around the back of the lines. Let's go have a look at this buffalo. It's actually a bit younger than I initially thought. I could just see it through there. So it is a female, it's a, a young female. And you can see there that there's still a lot of hair on the horns. 
which denotes the age. And look at those flies. Is that incredible? Oh. And they fed off the rump a little bit. So Margaret was wondering whether it was a large or small buffalo. Well, Margaret, there we go. It's a, a sub-adult. So an in-betweener, if you like. And it's very, very large. They're not blue flies. Oh, I've forgotten the name of that fly species now. Sure. Let's have a quick look. But you can see, look at that. So if you look at the nose carefully there, it looks like they also used, the lions used that sort of nose hole um, that we saw when this pride took down that buffalo bull a couple of months ago. And get onto the nose, basically that sink of their canine through the nose and as well as using the throat hold that the lions will uh, speed up the killing process by the buffalo drowning on its own blood by basically bleeding out of its nose and as it tries to breathe it just takes blood down into its lungs here we go um, i found the, the fly it is a regal blowfly that is on the nose that's the name i couldn't remember and there's a bit of aloe grooming happening brian if we pop up to the lions I was, uh, oh, sorry. I was I was looking in my book. Sorry, Brian. So there we go. So very important. Look at that, chewing on the air almost. So Mark Kilbury is wondering whether these lions are elephant hunters. Well, not today, Mark. Today they're buffalo hunters. Um, but one must remember that animal behavior is far more area-specific than species-specific. Um, lions and the Sabi Sands don't really hunt uh, elephants at all. Uh, Chobi, Savuti, uh, Linyanti, Kondo, areas in Botswana, they hunt elephants there regularly. And it's a also depends on the climate situation and with the Savuti marsh drying up and those areas becoming very dry during certain part, times of the year, uh, elephants are the only prey species available to those lions, so they've learned it's not normal behavior. Generally, uh, lions are huge fans of buffalo, giraffe, um, zebra, wildebeest, so that hunting elephants is, is out of the ordinary, but as I said, we must remember that animal behavior is rather area specific than species specific. As you hear that, so even though the buffalo is expired, it's still got dung, and the dung beetles are landing in to come get some of that stomach content that's been pulled out by the lions. Oh, look at that. You can see all the green on her stomach there, um, and, and she's been literally lying in the stomach content, and that's... This lioness went off for a wonder, but she's on her way back now. Oh, she's going to flop down with that big belly. Oh. question uh, from another vehicle I could put the camera on but I'll be nice and not do that um, so Tristan's guests actually I went to school with him and he's trying to be funny so we'll embarrass him on live National Geographic TV here uh, and uh, so he'd like to know do lions eat each other well actually in the Sabi Sands that happens more often than not and two lionesses from this pride were killed by a coalition of five male lions and eaten by them last year so it does happen it is unusual but it does happen Thank you very much. <laughs> so look at that, a little bit more 
aloe grooming going on, a little bit of playing. So Brenda from Virginia is wondering, does it look like the kill was made somewhere else and the lions have dragged under the bush? If I get Brian to come out wide here, and you can see there's quite a lot of disturbed soil up ahead of us um, around there. So probably, but I think the actual kill actually took place right underneath Tristan. Um, if we look under Mumps and Tristan, under their vehicle is where the actual kill took place. And then I do think they have dragged it into the shed. So guys, there's quite a lot of vehicles standing by for this sighting. So we're going to spend a few more minutes and then we're going to move out. hyena in the area. There are hyena in the area. Um, the other vehicle saw five and I'm quite sure they were attracted by the sound of this buffalo kill. Um, they do make quite a noise while they are expiring so that sort of noise will attract um, the hyenas. But they probably want to gather a few more numbers before challenging the lions. There we go. Doesn't she look comfy? Well actually the opposite of comfy with that fat belly. So lions have a very fast digestive system compared to other animals and they are able to consume large amounts of meat and sleep for a while and then start feeding again shortly. So I probably find the first hyena would have heard the lions uh, take down the buffalo. I think this probably happened in the early hours of this morning and would have come to investigate. And that's why I said, I think this evening is going to be incredibly interesting and uh, to see how many hyenas are attracted to this carcass. And there's only four lionesses here to defend it. So, we're going to have a last quick look before we give, oh wait, let's see if we can see something. No. Uh, before we give the other vehicles a chance to come in here. This is the only lions being found this morning, so there's a bit of a queue, and we are nice people, and we like to share with everyone else, and they would do the same for us. And there we go, she's eating a little bit of grass to aid digestion. So we'll wait for it to finish snacking. Observation from Anna McDougall, who asked, are, may, are lions the only cat to show such great sexual dimorphism? That is very, very well noted. They are. Um, all the other cats, even though the males are obviously a lot larger, uh, they still look similar, where there's a male lion with his mane looks quite different from a lioness. And uh, it is incredible sexual dimorphism. It's probably got something to do with them being the only social cat as well. Uh, so the competing for females and for mating has caused those males to produce that large man that protects them while they're fighting. Okay, guys, so we're going to have to skedaddle. And I know we'll definitely be back here on the sunset safari, but I don't think too much action is going to happen. I think they're going to sleep. So hopefully when we get back here on the sunset safari, they'll be a little bit more active. I'm just going to wait for... Here's that Roy to come in and then we'll move out. Roy, who's uh, next after you? So, I didn't copy you. So 
was just doing a bit of game drive admin. Okay, so. So as I said, they're not going to... Tristan's kindly given us a spot to stay a bit longer, so we're going to. And we'll just wait for the next vehicle to come a bit closer before we move out. And it is great to spend some time with these lovely ladies. Our next station can start making their way as soon as you get close. I'll move out for you. So a huge Safari White Live welcome to Samaya Patel, who's a new viewer. And she's wondering why the Inkahuma Pride do not have any males or cubs. So what's happened is they do have males, they're the Birmingham males. So male lions will often have sometimes up to three different groups of females that they lord over and they're out patrolling territory so they don't always spend all their time with the females and the reason they don't have cubs at the moment is because there's the new set of males have come in they've started mating with them but for the first three months that the new males are with the pride they will have a false estrus so they won't produce any you know, any cubs so only six months later they're more than likely to start producing cubs and the reason for that is for the lionesses not to expend that huge amount of energy it takes raising and rearing cubs uh, they have a false easter so just to make sure that the new males will stay around so that's why there are no cubs but hopefully towards the end of the year we'll start seeing some cubs Lions ever get as close to the camp as leopards? Uh, yes, Virginia, they often, uh, not that often in the last while, but early on, they will quite often get very close to the camp. Uh, I've actually watched the Inkuma Pride walk about five meters from final control. They've even walked past, or they've walked past our house quite a few times and the DRC. Now, as cuddly as a lion looks, you definitely wouldn't want one in your bed. A lioness like this, quite a big animal, probably weighs about 150 kilograms. much happening here. Hopefully there'll be a bit more action on the Sunset Safari. Oh, there we go. There was some action. So we can see those nice black marks behind the ears. The following mechanism. That's used for cubs to follow the females through the bush as well as visual indications during the hunting. So while we spend the last few minutes with these flat cats, Jamie's got a beautiful little insect to show you.
and they don't really come much more beautiful than this fire grid burnet moth that's currently sucking up a drop of water that I spread across my hand. I wanted to see if that's what he was after. It's exactly what he was after. Sucking it up with that long proboscis. Desperately looking for moisture. There he goes. It was quite a difficult process to get him to actually find the water and get onto it. So unfortunately I don't think it's something that we can repeat, but look how incredible this moth looks in the sun. The colors are absolutely extraordinary. And apropos what we were saying, oh, sorry. Apropos what we were saying about the aposmatic coloring, here he goes, past my monkey, my enormous monkey orange injury. I'm quite devastated, it's not more, <laughs> it's not more significant. And up my arm. But aposmatic coloring, that bright coloring that insects take on, is something that is so clever as a way of warning animals that this is toxic. As to whether or not it actually is, I'm not entirely sure. It could be example, an example of perfect aposmatic colouring. So this could well be toxic. Or it could just be clever mimicry, pretending to be something that's toxic or poisonous, as we discussed earlier. Isn't he cool? Such a beautiful little bug. Daytime moth. It is a moth species, not a butterfly. One of the few ones that we see during the day and still trying to lap up any moisture he can get by wandering around on my skin. That's what he's after. He's after my sweat. Here he goes. Awesome to see. So a fire grid burn it. I'm making, oh, bye bye, well timed. I'm making sure that we know what it is because Margaret, you didn't know what bird that was. And of course I was so busy laughing at the fact that it flew away. Yes, Margaret, you're absolutely right. It was a European roller that we were looking at that decided to play camera shy. And just quickly while I've got And here we've got a perfect track of both. The train track is the millipede the two track wandering along the sand and although the light isn't the best for showing you civet tracks these little round tracks are those of a civet walking down the road they're like i can almost describe them as a perfectly miniature little leopard tracks and we're going to move on and look for more wonders of the bush to show you but i'm going to send you back over to brent so you can spend your last few moments with the lions so welcome back we're just going to have one last look at the beautiful ladies of the Inca Huma pride and we're going to head off back towards Juma so flat cats not much action happening here but it'll be very interesting to see what's happening on the sunset safari well done ladies Uh, so 
so as we were saying, there's very little hierarchy uh, in INS. Very, very, very sort of ethnic. Am I going nowhere? You okay, Brian? Little sneaky, flicky one. Let's break it for the next person coming through. So, no, Michael, no real um, hierarchy amongst lionesses. Uh, leaving Roy, uh, Doug making his way, and I think Lazarus next in line. Okay, we're nearly back on the road. Safari Live, welcome to Amber in Washington. Um, Amber would like to know why did those male lions kill and eat the other lions? Uh, Amber, it happens quite often during coalition takeovers. Not always, but sometimes. And, uh, well, it's very difficult to say that they kill them uh, because they won't sort of join the pride, so to speak. It's sort of a, a dominance thing. And to eat them, it could just be the available food there, so they eat. Uh, sometimes they don't eat the whole carcass, sometimes they do. So literally you'll see my footprints about right here is where I was stopped walking when I was looking for the lines this morning and then drove around in big circles. I should have just carried on walking. That's where the tracks went out into Arethusa. coalitions take over an area, they can be quite aggressive. Uh, quite often the females, if they've got youngsters, um, they won't immediately succumb to the, the, uh, to the new males, so they often quite fight. And also you must re remember when these male lions are taking over an area, their blood is up, so to speak, their testosterone levels are pumping, they've been fighting males, and the slightest little reaction from a female might uh, get a response that wouldn't normally be that, that, that aggressive or whatnot, but during that time, it can be very aggressive, and that's why quite often a few females get killed during the fire takeover. Oh, there's corrugations. population for southern Africa. Oh, I actually looked this up recently, Steve. Brian's trying to find that little bird that disappeared into the thicket there and it's hopping around the bottom. Let's wait for it to pop out a little bit. Looks like a possible cystic cooler. Uh, but uh, the lion population for southern Africa is probably around 2,000... Uh, 2,500 if I remember correctly. I might be wrong on that one. You guys might need to double check me. So please do check. Uh, just be careful. There's going to be a lot of different conflicting information on the internet. Uh, not all of it is true. And just be careful about where you get your source of your, the source of your information from. I'm trying to see what bird it is and it's not. It looked to be a little flycatcher initially. I can't see his face at the moment. You need to go forward a little bit, Brian. That's worse. Nice little bit of a better view there. 
there. Have a look. See him preening in the center of the screen. Oh, look at that little fly catcher. Unfortunately, I can't really see which one it is through the, the thorns. Oh, and off it goes. wondering if I managed to figure out which lark or pippet we saw the other day on safari. I did eventually. It was a melodious lark. Uh, it was what we saw, a melodious lark. So we're going to continue checking towards the northwestern corner. While we do that, let's go see what Jamie has been up to. been an incredible morning and that search for the lions eventually paid off and I'm so glad that it did. Unfortunately our search for the leopard hasn't, can't, hasn't quite gone as according to plan although I guess we've been a little bit spoiled. Maybe I shouldn't jinx it but we really I mean we've had some amazing leopard sightings recently so to have bumped into shadow again two, off, two, two drives in a row would probably be asking a bit much but we'll at least have somewhere to follow up on in the morning or in the afternoon the sunset safari so you'll have to stay tuned and see if she decides to pop out the temperature has gone up astronomically Andrew and myself are now surrounded by our um, what would we call it entourage I'm gonna call it I'm gonna call it an entourage of flies that is accompanying us swarming all over Andrew <laughs> all over myself looking in the same way that that fire grid Bernard moth was, looking for water, but of course they're not as attractive and they're slightly more pesky than that particular moth species. A little bit less welcome if I'm completely honest, particularly since they bite. Oopsie. <laughs> Sorry Andrew, I can't see the road. <laughs> Interesting. With apparently with Andrew splayed across the bonnet as he was in order to get the shot. Apparently that hampers my ability somewhat to see the road. Now we've discussed <laughs> it's Andrew's Andrew's tripod for the morning. But back to more serious and important matters. We've been discussing the drought a great deal over this drive and the last few drives and the last few weeks. And it's of course a question that plays on everybody's mind and as the prey numbers start to drop Michael you're wondering if they will if that will in turn re result in a drop in the predator numbers it depends on how drastically the numbers drop because obviously we've spoken before about how when the prey numbers suffer during the drought the predators are actually successful because they have either they have easy access to prey coming down to drink it's more concentrated or they have easy access to carcasses that they can scavenge off and believe me when I say that not one of the predators out here will pass up a meal like that I've seen leopards scavenge off buffalo kills lions will scavenge if they find something and of course hyena will as well so they're all not above scavenging a certain kill if however it really does get to the point that the prey numbers are decimated and struggle to recover over a couple of years at that point then it becomes then you start to see the knock-on effect on the predator numbers but it's all a matter of time and exactly how the drought affects the prey numbers and as we've said in this nice big open area it's something that will result in the strongest genes being selected for in this particular case but for the rest of the country for the farmers for the smaller reserves that the animals can't move around in it becomes a lot more difficult so there's always a sort of basically with predator and prey numbers there's essentially a delay so I was going to try and draw a graph for you whilst driving whilst Andrew sits on the bonnet so that's not going to work at all but if you imagine the curve let's say this is the curve of, of prey population and it goes like this up and over the predator population 
will follow it but just slightly delayed in terms of time so the numbers will follow a similar trend but maybe two or three years down the line I don't know if that graphical representation made any sense at all it did in my head I can see the graph in my head maybe something I probably should have drawn in the sand for you I have to find some sand first though it's a bit damp here <laughs> you get the idea. Essentially it's a knock-on effect that ha happens after time. Oh I've got to be careful here there's a bush bushwalk. Managed to avoid it. information coming through. So from the answers that the audience have been provided is essentially an average of around 150 within South Africa, which makes sense. I didn't say I could think of easily over 100. So thank you for, thank you to Star and Gilly and Charlie for sending through basically you had it in the rough range between 120 and 160 species of snake within South Africa itself. Now my guess would be that a conservative estimate to answer Joseph's question going all the way back to the beginning of the drive, how many snakes are there in Africa? If there are 160 in South Africa or 150 in South Africa or in southern, let's say southern Africa to be conservative, you're looking at easily, I would say, 400, 500 species of snakes in Africa. Fascinating to think about. But thank you all for sending through that information. It really is helpful. Whilst we're looking for wonderful things to show you out on drive, it's useful to have you all sending through the little niggly questions that we would love to know the answer to. Let me dodge. So we've got some more information flooding through from Scotty D, who is in final control. And Scott says there's 2,600 snakes in the world. Okay, so we know that there's no snakes in... Hello, piggies. Well, guys, it has been wonderful to be out and about. We're going to leave you with this wonderful visual of the warthog's family lying in the road. And I'm going to say a big thank you to Andrew quickly for his brilliant camera work and nimble hopping over things. He's been fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, I will catch you later. For now, Brent has a ground horn bill. Uh, Brent, come back. So we've just bumped into a ground horn bill. Sorry, guys, just someone's calling me on the radio. <laughs> Go ahead, Craig. Uh, Brent, who was the last uh, trick for Scott Kanye at a crime on yesterday? Uh, Ephraim, Ephraim called them in. All right, thanks. There we go, he's caught something. A little, it's a male ground hornbill. And we have been seeing a nice little flock, uh, but this is just a single one. One of the more rare birds in Southern Africa. And a little scratch. So what a wonderful way to end the sunrise safari with one of the rarest birds in Southern Africa and awesome to have been able to spot those uh, Kahumas on a nice big buffalo kill. And definitely it's gonna be very interesting to see what plays out there. Uh, they're right on the edge of uh, two hyena clans, a really big clan from the west that really gives lions a hard time, and our normal tumor clan. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the sunset safari, I'm sure. Scott and James will be, one of the two will be there. So James is back on sunset safari. So I know a lot of you will be very happy to hear that. And uh, our last little lesson from uh, our sunrise safari is when you're tracking lions, don't forget your catapult. So for the last few seconds, let's see if we can have a last, oh no, he's disappeared, but don't forget your catapult.